Okay, now we're going to turn in our code book to Oracle 430.248, and that's a table. You got your glued in piece underneath it, right? Your six step format on motor calculations. This is going to size the different components for a motor. Before we get into this, we're on page uh, 332. Here's what I want everybody to understand a couple things about a motor. When you start a motor at full load current, and you bring, well, you bring current straight to that motor, and it's not a soft start. It's not a ramp up, it's not a stage start. When you bring full power to a motor, it's at a dead stop. It's called a locked rotor. That's the setting, it's called a locked rotor. And it's gonna shoot a high inrush current to get that motor to start spinning. Now once that motor starts spinning, it's gonna go down to an, whatever the rating of that motor is. The full load current is the rating of that motor, right? But we've got what's called a locked rotor system a locked rotor ideal. So we got to make sure that our fuse or circuit breaker can handle that locked rotor time frame. It's like kicks it up way high to start and as it starts to move and that drops way down. If we have a fuse or circuit breaker that let's say it's rated 100 amps and we got an inrush current of 500 amps. Well if that 500 amps kicks up there and stays there well of course we're going to trip that breaker right? But if it's a fast acting breaker, such an instantaneous trip, or a fast acting fuse, such a you know uh, instant, you know quick blow fuse as we call them, it's not going to like that, right? So before we get into this, I want you to understand we're going to have some larger fuses or circuit breakers to compensate for that inrush current. So all the things that you guys think about on your other circuits, your branch circuits, feeders, and you rate a a, a circuit at a certain size, like for a 200 amp circuit you're going to pull three aught conductors in copper, right? And you're going to connect it to a 200 amp breaker and everything sounds good in your mind. For a 20 amp circuit, you're going to run a number 12 gauge wire and connect it to a 20 amp circuit breaker and everything's going to be kosher, right? When we talk about motors, we might have that 12 gauge wire on a 100 amp breaker to compensate for the inrush current. And you've got to make peace with that in your mind. So before we get into this, we've got this right next to that table, 430.248, we got a 430.249 table. You see that? I want you to take your dark color highlighter and I want you to X out 430.249 table. Just put an X through it. While you got your dark color highlighter, I want you to look at article and table 430.250, which is on the next page. In article or the table 250, 430.250, we've got voltage ranges up there. We start out at 115 volts. I want you to X out that 115 volts where it goes with 4.4, 6.4, 8.4, 12.0, 13.6, X it out. And then I want you to look at the voltage ranges from left to right. Between the 460 and 575, I want you to do what I call a fence post. Straight line between after the, to the right of, our, of the 460 voltage and to the left of 575, straight down, make a line with your dark color highlighter. At the very top of this page where it says 430.250, I want you to write the three phase three with a zero and a slash through it or just write the words three phase up there at the very top of the page. That way you know this table is for three phase. Over top of the 430.248 table, I want you to write single phase. The 248 table is all about single phase. And then while we're here on this viewing plane, let's look on underneath that 430.250 table. You'll see another table down below it. And it's got like a, a margin to the right of that table. This is a 430.251A table. I want you to uh, do a, a frame of that table, but I want you to take to the right of that table that blank space. I want you to make it big because we're going to put a note over there. Now you've got that blank spot that you've got inside your box. And with your pen, I want you to write single phase locked rotor. Single phase locked rotor. The one with the zero and the slash through it for single phase, or write the word single phase, but also write the words locked rotor. On the next page, you're going to see a, the table 430.251B, and it takes up the whole page. I want you to write at the very top of that page, three phase locked rotor. Three phase locked rotor. Could be just a simple question about a motor. Let's look at this while we're looking here. If we have a 10 horsepower motor, and it's fed with 480 volts, which would be 460 volt motor voltage, right? Three phase. What's the locked rotor? 81. Simple lookup reference table, right? 
If they're asking for a locked rotor, they're looking for these tables, not the other. Now, the reason why that might be confusing, remember that 10 horsepower at 460 volts is 81, right? Let's go back to our 430.250 table. Let's find that same motor, 10 horsepower fed with 480 volts. What is a full load current? 14. So what I'm saying is this, is on a 10 horsepower motor, you got 14 for full load current and 81 for locked rotor current. Make sure you're on the right table, right? If they ask for locked rotor, don't go to the full load current table. If they ask for full load current, don't go to the locked rotor table. And if they're asking for a 10 horsepower motor, make sure you're not looking at the single phase locked rotor or the single phase full load current if they're asking for 480 volt three phase. So let's look at, at our single phase ideal. If we got a, a single phase locked rotor 10 horsepower motor with 230 volts, what's, it, what's the number there? 300 amps for 10 horsepower fed with 230 volts. And then for our full load current of that 10 horsepower at 230 volts, what is it? 50. That's six times, is it not? Think about it. 50 times six is 300. So what we're talking about in these tables for locked rotor, it's almost six times on the tables more ampacity to get it going than it is for it to run. These tables are just a quick reference. Now let's look at our six step motor formula. Let's look at step number one. Step number one says full load current and it tells you the tables that we're dealing with is a table 430.248 for single phase, 430.250 for three phase. Now to understand those tables, let's look at that 430.248. Let's read through the title block and then the actual information says full load currents in amps, single phase, alternating current motors. The following values of full load current are for motors running at usual speeds and motors with normal torque characteristics. <coughs> the voltages listed are rated motor voltages. The currents listed shall be permitted for system voltage ranges of 110 to 120. See in the middle there, it's got 115 on the table. And then 220 to 240. See in the middle there, you got 230. So what's the two horsepower fed with 120 volts? What's the impasse of that? How about a two horsepower fed with a 230 volt three phase? 6.8, right? When you go to three phase, you gotta go to the other table. And then how about if we fed that two horsepower with 480 volt? 3.4, right? To start any of these questions, unless they give you an impasse of a motor on a test question, You've got to look at these tables. Everything is going to be sized based on these tables for the, for the base circuit. The only thing that's not going to be sized based on these tables, let's get this understood, is the overload protection. Now let's talk about overload protection versus fusing circuit breaker. When you hear the word overload or overcurrent, you, you think of fuses and circuit breakers, right? No. In a motor circuit, the overload protector is that little thing that's got the reset button on it, generally speaking. For the IEC style of this, it's the overload relay, right? It's got a little dial on it. You can dial it up or dial it, tune it in, tune it up, down, up, whatever you want to do. For the NEMA style of these, it's got those replaceable heaters, right? Exchangeable heaters. You take the heaters out, you bolt new ratchet type heaters in, right? You guys play with motors, you understand that. But that's the overload. That's what protects that circuit. Uh, in, in an overcurrent issue. Now the fuser circuit breaker that we're going to be sizing for these motors is ground fault and short circuit protection. We're not worried about the impacity. We're worried about ground fault and short circuit. If we have a ground fault, which means one of the legs, one of the phases touched a grounded raceway or a box or the enclosure, you know, the motor enclosure, whatever it is, that's a ground fault. The whole idea of an equipment ground system is to take that current straight back to the breaker or fuse and help facilitate kicking the breaker or blowing the fuse. If we have a short circuit, that's taking two of the phases or a hot neutral and they touch each other somehow. Well, if that happens, you want that fuse or circuit breaker to kick or blow very quickly, right? And it does. I want everybody to understand, if we've got a 100 amp breaker and we got some number 12 gauge wire connected to it, if we take two of those phases and touch them together on a 12 gauge wire, what's gonna happen to that breaker? It's gonna trip, right? If we take a wire that's connected to a 100 amp breaker, number 12 gauge, or whatever size wire you want to touch it, and you connect it to a grounded surface, what's going to happen? It's going to trip that breaker very quickly. So I want you guys to understand that and make 
uh, this easier to handle. When I'm telling you we're gonna put a number 12 gauge wire on a 100 amp breaker, you say, no, that's illegal. No, for a motor circuit, it's not. You're gonna fight with yourself. Those are the guys that's got all the experience and knowledge in this room. You're gonna fight with yourselves. Well, I wouldn't put a 12 gauge wire on a 100 amp breaker. You can't make me do it. But that's the right answer on test day. So, we start this process by looking at these tables. 